All right, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very kindly for the day. We thank you for bringing us back together after a wonderful Easter. We ask that you bless our time together as we look into the book of Revelation. Not so much as an exercise in head knowledge, as it is to understand what we are and what you have done for us, what we have become, what we are becoming, and what we will yet become through what our Savior has purchased and accomplished on the cross of Calvary simply because it pleased you. It doesn't make sense to us. It sometimes assaults our sense of fairness. But if we rightly divide the word, we understand that you are not fair. Scripture makes no claim to you being fair. And we are very grateful for that. Else we would all spend an eternity apart from you. But we serve a just God. And because we do serve a just God, His holiness required that somebody pay the penalty for the sin. And so we are so very grateful it was Him and not us. So it is in that vein that we claim our sonship as he said we could and we come boldly to the throne as he also said we should we make our prayers and petitions to you and in the midst of all that because we are needy people because we are still stuck in these tents of flesh we're falling apart all around us we sometimes forget that there's more to our discussion with you than just our wants and needs and we pray that you continually find us a thankful and grateful people as well you are worthy to be praised and we attempt to do so we come in the name of Jesus all glory going to him amen amen, amen. okay we are in chapter 14. We will really try hard to finish chapter 14. We're starting in verses 12 and 13. That's Revelation 14, verses 12 and 13. I know last time I was up here, I lost you all. So I'll try and pay attention this time. Verse 12 and 13, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Now this is, uh, these verses follow the three angels, right? Yep. <coughs> the first angel proclaiming the gospel. Mm -hmm. The second angel proclaiming the fall of Babylon. And the third angel proclaiming the eternal damnation of those who have refused Jesus. Verse 13, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Now, blessedness is one of those words 
that I equate to a certain Greek word that we translate love, right? And that's kind of unfortunate. I was asked by a pastor once when I made that statement that you have love, you have agape or agapeo, the verb and the noun, and that that word means a decision of the mind. It is a commitment. It is something you decide to do irrespective of your feelings. Because the basis of that word does not look upon the object and the object's worth or worthiness or even ability or willingness to reciprocate. This is a kind of this kind of love that the Bible says that God has for us. And has a love that the kind of love that was required because when we were introduced to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, we were at the very least unlovely, if not disgusting. Or as my three-year-old granddaughter would say, that's disgusting. So joy or blessedness is one of those words contrary and opposite of happiness. They are not the same. We are commanded to be joyful. It's a decision of the mind. James in chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face diverse temptations. <laughs> really? <clears throat> Some of us have loved ones in the hospital. Some of us have loved ones who have recently passed. And in the midst of that, we are, we are to consider that joy. Not something to be happy about. But there is joy in that. My pastor was talking about that this morning. James says, consider pure joy when you, whenever you face diverse temptations or in some of your translations, trials of many kinds. And you wonder how you can do that. And I believe you have to go back to, and I think it's Rome, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, where God talks about disciplining his children. Right? And the fact that we face discipline, we receive discipline, the thing to consider joyful about that is that according to scripture, it validates our sonship. Otherwise, we are illegitimate. Mm -hmm. So blessedness is up here between your ears. Joy is right up here between your ears. Happiness is how you feel about what's going on. It's externally motivated. Joy is internally motivated. Yes. Okay, so this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. The phrase, the perseverance of the saints, introduces one of the most important and most comforting doctrines in Scripture. It expresses the truth that all those whom God has elected, called, and justified will never lose their faith, but will persevere in it until death. Did you or did you not hear the pastor speak today in Romans 8, where it says there's nothing under the sun, nothing in the heavens, on earth, below the earth, nothing else in creation, including you, that can separate us from the love of Christ. Amen. I guarantee you, people, if we could, 
lose our salvation, we certainly would. Aren't you glad that's not up to us? Aren't you glad that according to John 10, God has us. Christ has us. The Holy Spirit is a seal of our inheritance. The guarantee, just in case, right, God forgets. Oh, yeah. Sure. That reality provides assurance, hope, and joy to the believer in Jesus Christ and brings to, a, brings to an end fear and doubt. Okay, yeah, that's probably not true. But it should bring to an end fear and doubt. And I would suggest possibly that if there is still fear and doubt, we have not what? Read the book. The book. <laughs> it also reveals that believers' deaths are deaths are blessed because death ushers them into the glories of heaven. I don't fear dying, and I hope you don't either. The how might be a little scary, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. People ask me, aren't you afraid riding your motorcycle back and forth into the Bay Area? I go, no, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid. The only thing I'm afraid of is that I'll only get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Guys who ride motorcycles don't have accidents. We get hurt. Yeah. All I did was fall over in a parking lot and I got hurt and I lived for a month. <laughs> That was an 800 pound motorcycle falling on my leg, right? Yeah, and you got yeah. a, a back on and did that. Oh, sure, of course. So my daddy taught me. Mm -hmm. The horse throws you off, get right back on. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it happened to me, I don't, know, I don't know how old I was. Before I could really swim, <laughs> fell out of the float and about drowned. And dad jumped in and got me. Come up coughing and spluttering, and he wouldn't let me go. He wouldn't let me look. He wouldn't let me get out of the pool. He had a hold of me. He wouldn't let me get out of the pool. Three minutes later, I'm playing and splashing around. He did a good thing. And so when the pastor talks to us this morning about persecutions and trials and troubles and Waiting on God. God's doing a good thing. We may not like it. In fact, nine out of ten times we won't, right? <laughs> the persevering character of saving faith is never more clearly and powerfully seen than in this passage of Scripture. No group of believers ever has faced or ever will face stronger assaults on their faith than these tribulation saints. Mm. There is no stronger evidence that saving faith perseveres than the reality that the most tested believers in history will maintain their saving faith until the end. Well, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows, nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the troubles that are coming. We can read about it. It's going to be unimaginable. Unimaginable. And we have not yet gotten to chapter 16. Now chapter 15 is only eight verses long. But there's a wealth of material in there. The introduction to the bold judgments. And where God shuts himself up in the temple and will not let anybody enter. Anybody enter until it is finished. All right, I have a handout, and I'm going to interrupt the class and hand that out because we'll go over a little bit of it. Some people call it the perseverance of the saints. 
I prefer to call it the preservation of the saints because it has less to do with you and me and more to do with what God has taken care of. The Bible does talk about the perseverance of the saints. Absolutely. We are to persevere. Perseverance is not simply sucking it up, waiting it out, being patient while God does whatever it is he's doing. Oh, no. There's a whole different attitude behind perseverance. It requires us to talk to God and ask him, what am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to be learning? Not, why me? Why not you? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, let me tell you this. If you read the book, there's no such thing as a good person. Scripture makes it clear that only one is good, and that is God. And we ain't Him. All right, we ready? You have the handout entitled Perseverance of the Saints. The biblical doctrine of the perseverance of the saints rests on five solid, unshakable pillars in many scholars' opinions should be more properly referred to as the preservation of the saints. Pillar number one is that God promised, God's promise established it. And we appreciate this, do we not? That we have, we have, if you will, bet our entire eternity on the word of one man. Step number two, pillar number two, God's purpose assures it. Pillar number three, and you can look these references up at your leisure. In fact, you probably should. As part of your duties as a student, you do not take what I say without checking it out. That's right. I'll do my best by it, but I'm only human. Pillar number three, God's power guarantees it. Pillar number four, the perseverance of the tribulation saints will be evident because they will keep the commandments of God. That is the evidence. You understand this, right? That Salvation is not by works, at least not ours. Salvation is by works. The works of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Not by us. So we cannot earn salvation through our works. But I guarantee you the Bible tells you very clearly that we are saved to works. God did not pull me out of the slave market of sin and bring me into the kingdom of light and the kingdom of righteousness and allow his son to die on the cross so I could sit on my haunches and do nothing. Ephesians 2 verse 10 For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do those things which he has purposed in advance for us to do. How far in advance do you think, maybe? Before the foundation of the earth. Pillar number five. Now, those of you who are English teachers, I've got, I got some, I got some mistakes in this paragraph. All right. But there it is, pillar number five. All right. Verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven. This is seven times in total this phrase is heard in the Revelation. The implication is that this is unusually important and a direct divine pronouncement. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. This is one of, this is the second of seven Beatitudes that John writes in the book of Revelation. Amazingly enough, it, it, it announces a blessing on those who die. And those 
of us who are aging <coughs> certainly relate to that, can't we? Yeah. I want to be here every minute that the Lord has me here. But I'm ready to go any minute. Right? The obvious question that the text provokes is why are the dead blessed? The answer it presents is twofold. The dead in view here are blessed because of how they lived and because of how they died. 2 Corinthians 5 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Who are these dead? We think they're the victims executed at the prompting of the beast. They will experience in death the fullest reward because, and I quote, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. End quote. Psalm 116, verse 15. The mantra at this period of time is worship or be slain. You understand that? Worship or be slain. That's the same mantra that Nebuchadnezzar made to those three Hebrew boys. Mm -hmm. Worship or be slain. Mm -hmm. And their response was, hmm? no. Our God's able to save us. Whether he does or not, it's his business, but no. God's mantra is be slain and be blessed. All right. Yes, says the Spirit. I, this is one of only two times, at least in the book of Revelation, that the Holy Spirit is quoted as having said something. That's pretty cool. I don't know why I think it is, but... It goes on to say they will... Uh, it, it's There's... Two further reasons for the tribulation martyr's blessedness. It goes on to say they will rest from their labor. Here is the direct opposite of the beast worshipers who will have no rest day or night. The saints will rest from their troubles and harsh treatment, but at, at death the troubles of their antagonists will only have just begun with no end in sight. There is no light at the end of this tunnel. Goes on to say, for their deeds will follow them. We know this to be true as believers. It is referred to in scripture as the Bema Seat Judgment or the Judgment Seat of Christ. We've talked of, the, we've talked of this judgment where it will occur is in heaven. It is very um, oh specific, uh, exclusive. That's the word. That's the swear word of today, isn't it? Exclusive. This judgment will be very exclusive. Not everybody gets a trophy here, but only believers will be present. And it's not what we have done that will be judged. And the word for this judgment is more along the lines of assessed. Much the same way you would assess gold or silver or any other precious metal. You would assess it for impurities. And how you would do that might be through the examination of fire that would melt the dross that floats to the top that is scooped off and discarded. And so this believer's judgment is more judgment of assessment. Not what you did, but why'd you do it? Where was your heart? Where was your heart when you spent all those years in Sunday school teaching those, those babies? 
Where was your heart when you stood before the heritage group? Well, there's a danger here, folks. If somebody stands before you and expounds on the Word of God and does it any other for any other reason except for the glory of God, that effort will go up like wood, hay, and stubble at the believer's judgment. And there will be tears. When people tell you there will there will be no more tears in heaven, you got to be real sure of where you are on the timeline. Because this ain't it. There will be tears at the believer's judgment. I spent all those years in ministry for what? It all went up in smoke. And what does the Bible tell you? You already got your reward. People are applauding. Aren't you a good guy? Look at you. Well, there's your reward. But anything you cart up to heaven with you is going to go up in wood like wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to be smoke. And you're just going to stand there with your pockets inside out, smelling of a barbecue, <laughs> standing right next to the thief on the cross, who, in his defense, had no opportunity, right, to earn anything except believe to throw at the feet of his Savior. And this is why we do what we do. It's an act of gratitude. The master did not give his servants more than he knew they were capable of, but what he gave them, he expected them to do something with. And this is us. This is you and me. We all can't be MacArthur's. We all can't be Jim Marion's. You certainly don't want to be me. Mm -hmm. But each of you is gifted in your own way. Each of you is part of the body. Yes. And if you are not functioning to the best of your ability, no matter what, that aspect of your job or your role in the body is, and you are letting the rest of us down. Because mm. I guarantee you that the body needs little toes. You don't think so? Stub one one time. And it will affect how the whole body walks. So I say this to me more than I say it to you. Stop messing around. Get up off the couch, Mr. Potato Head, <laughs> and be busy about what God has you to do. Right. And, I, and I, I am of the opinion, and that's all this is, that what that might be may change over our lifetimes here. All some of us may be able to do physically is pray. Well, hallelujah. Chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. We'll talk about that word. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grape from the earth's vine, because its grapes are right we'll talk about that word those two words called ripe in the English are not the same word in the Greek and they have entirely different meanings verse 19 the angel swung his sickle on the earth gathered its grapes and threw them into the great 
winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 184 miles. All right, the introduction to these verses goes as follows. <coughs> Jesus came the first time as a servant. Remember, we've talked about this numerous times. He will return as a sovereign king. Amen. In his first coming, he came in humility. In his second coming, he will come in majesty and splendor. Amen. The first time he came to earth, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 And when he returns, it will be to judge the living and the dead. 2 Timothy 4.1 Jesus came the first time as a sower. He will come the second time as a reaper. Isaiah 13, verses 11 through 13. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. <coughs> Isaiah 13. Well, that was then. That was that bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament. The New Testament God is love. Kumbaya. Matthew chapter 13. Then he left the crowd. These are verses 36 through 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is in the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up, pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. <clears throat> the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Wow. They will throw them in the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This passage pictures the final harvest of divine wrath and two agricultural motifs. The grain harvest and the grape harvest. There is a difference. Verse 14, I looked and behold, indicates another major advancement in the revelation. The reaper is seated as he waits for the proper time to stand and begin the reaping. It's described as one like the Son of Man. That is usually a term of the Christ. I heard the fan kick on, so hopefully it'll cool off. We're inclined to believe that this is, that personally, that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
fulfilling the prophecy himself of Luke chapter 21, verse 27. When it says, they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The Son of Man was the sower in Matthew 13, and the Son of Man is the reaper in Revelation 14. This is the last time the title Son of Man is used in the entire Bible. connects the Lord Jesus with the earth. The Son of Man connects the Lord Jesus with the earth and is therefore used of this harvest of the earth. He had a crown of gold on his head. This is a Stephanos or a victor's crown. He will not wear the diadem until chapter 19. The diadem is a crown that belongs to the king. The rightly appointed king. sharp sickle is in his hand. Seven of the eight New Testament usages of this Greek word are in this scene of the harvest and the vintage. The only other one outside of this is Mark 4.29. This implement introduces the image of a harvest and tells what the sun is about to do to the world. Not four, two. Three times we are reminded that the sickle is sharp and therefore will do its reaping without difficulty and completely. It also might be indicative of the Trinity being involved in this reaping. Verse 15, the angel came out of the temple. The fact that the angel comes from the temple seems to allude to this judgment as proceeding from the righteousness of God. In other words, the command to begin the judgment comes from God himself in his holy temple. And as we know, there is a Greek word for this temple, naos, N-A-O-S. And it could mean the entire temple. The Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. It could mean the entire tabernacle. The Holy Place and the Holy of Holies. Context, however, dictates that it is referring to the Holy of Holies. God did not live in the Holy Place. He dwelt between the cherubim on the seat of his mercy. So in this particular case, we are talking about the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. The time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Harvesting is an Old Testament figure for divine judgment, and especially that of Babylon, Jeremiah 51:33. He delivers a message from the God the Father to God the Son. It's time for him to move in judgment. Following the pattern of Joel chapter 3 verse 13, the scene furnishes two pictures of the same judgment. And we are familiar with this throughout scripture, are we not? The two dreams of Pharaoh, for example. Two different dreams meaning the same thing. The reason they're repeated in Joel is to emphasize the terror of what's about to happen. The Greek word here for ripe means dried up, withered, overripe, or rotten. The grain pictured here has point past the point of any usefulness and is fit only to be gathered up and burned with fire. So your English word ripe here in this verse 15 means overripe, means rotten. We'll get to the other ripe in just a second. 
Verse 16. Swung his sickle over the earth. The sickle is cast upon or against the earth. Most clearly, this is a judgment. The spiritual powers are reaped, as the national powers will be trodden down in the vintage. Oftentimes, we have physical events happening to illuminate spiritual truth. John 11, raising Lazarus from the dead. It's a great one. And the application of that is found in Ephesians and Colossians when it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Having all the capabilities spiritually that Lazarus did physically after being in the tomb for four days and starting to rot. <clears throat> the earth was harvested. Harvested. The brevity of this statement dramatizes the suddenness of this judgment. Here is one of the most tragic and sobering statements in all of Scripture, simply and without fanfare. It records the executing of divine judgment. The frightening details of that judgment are unfolded in chapter 16. Loathsome and malignant sores on the worshipers of Antichrist. The death of all life in the world's oceans. The turning of the world's rivers and springs of water into blood. The intensifying of the sun's heat until it scorches and burns people. Painful darkness all over Antichrist's kingdom. The drying up the Euphrates River in preparation for a massive invasion by the kings of the east. And the most powerful and destructive earthquake in history. Well, and I don't mean recorded history. I mean in the history of God's creation. This will be a shaker. When it talks about mountains fleeing, I get the impression God's going to level the joint. We sang about it this morning, didn't we not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Valleys rise up, and mountains rise down. It'll be Kansas everywhere you see. Yes, I have a question, sir. I am not a farmer, so I think there's terminology here that I'm not understanding. But in verse, verse 15, when it begins to quote, he says, "Put in your sickle." Right. And then he goes down to 18, and once again in the middle of that verse, "Put in your sickle." Yes. I don't understand the "put in." Okay. So. Okay. When we, har when we harvested wheat in Idaho, right? You put the sickle into the wheat, and you do it in a sweeping motion, and you're laying flat the wheat. Then somebody comes along and gathers it up, ties it in bushels, and loads it on the truck. So it's put in is the action of the sickle? Yes, you're putting the sickle into the wheat to cut it off. Thank you. Yeah. Now, you don't use that kind of sickle when you harvest grapes. But you use a handheld, hooked knife that does a similar thing. So you have to go in. Oh, har harvest, harvesting grapes is gross. It's hard work, it's dirty work, it's full of bugs. Okay. All right. Verse 18, folks. Still an another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar. The authority of this angel over fire is an allusion to chapter 8, verse 3 and following, where an angel took a censer full of fire and threw it into the earth. Where do you get the fire? From the altar. Which altar? Which altar? Bronze or gold? Which altar? Gold. The golden altar in the tabernacle and the temple 
was lit by the fire of the bronze altar and incense was burned on it right outside the veil leading into the Holy of Holies and is representative of the prayers of the saints wafting into the nostrils like a sweet smelling savor. So it is fires, fire from the coals of the altar. Now I'm betting on the gold altar because we've established that in previous chapters. That if, it, that if it was in the tabernacle, if it was in God's temple, if the angel had left the temple and had coals of fire, it could not have been the bronze altar because the bronze altar was located outside the tabernacle and outside the temple. Only the golden altar inside. So the implication of this reference to fire suggests the figure of a minister of wrath responding to the prayers of the saints. Remember this? The uncountable measure of tribulation saints under or before the altar going, how long? And here's your answer. In the book of Psalms, they're called imprecatory psalms. Psalm 137 is a good example. And you can find many the people of God pray for his vengeance against his enemies and theirs. Gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The word for ripe here is an entirely different Greek word. It's not the same Greek word used in verse 15. This word refers to something fully ripe and in its prime. It pictures earth's wicked, unregenerate people as bursting with the fruit, the juice of wickedness and ready to be the harvest of righteousness. Quite a different version of ripe, don't you think? And this, this crop, this harvesting will not initially see the fire as the first harvest did. This harvest will be put into the wine press of God. One gigantic stone basin connected by a trough to another stone basin. And the grapes are placed, placed in the upper basin and stomped by the reapers until the juice flows into the lower basin. And our Lord Jesus is the reaper. And he shows up later his clothes and his robes stained with the juice of this particular vintage. These are not happy thoughts. But they're very clearly illuminated and illustrated and declared in God's holy writ. There are three particular vines mentioned in scripture that I can find. Maybe you can find more. The first one, Israel, was referred to as God's vine, planted in the line to bear fruit for God's glory. Psalm 80, verses 8 through 16. Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. You getting this okay, buddy? Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46. So Israel was a vine. Christ is the vine, and believers are the branches. John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Amen. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. It's our job to bear the fruit, not produce the fruit. The fruit belongs to the Holy Spirit. 
Our job is to bear it. You understand the difference? A branch by itself can produce what? Not a, not a lick of anything. And this is why you can prune a vine down to the stub because it is the stub where there's life. The third vine is the world system. It's referred to as a vine of the earth in contrast to Christ who is the heavenly vine. We find this in Deuteronomy 32, 32 and 33. And here in our text in Revelation 14. Verse 19. Threw them into the great, great winepress of God's wrath. I got a note here to read a piece of scripture, so let's do that. Isaiah 63. Verses 1 through 6. Who is this that cometh from Eden? Edom, sorry. With dyed garments from Basra. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked and there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Holy moly. God's upset here. This action will actually be fulfilled in Revelation chapter 16 and 19. The exact same figure of speech will be used. The redness of the juice and the staining of the feet and garments of the treaders make this an apt picture of divine judgment. Genesis 49, 11. Revelation 19, 13 says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Joel chapter 3 verse 9 through 17 describes the vintage of God's judge, judgment as follows. Proclaim ye among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Mm -hmm. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in that valley of decision the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining wow. the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth will shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. 
so shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion my holy mountain then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore Nahum 1 verse 2 calls our God the Lord of wrath he is absolute master of his judgments will give them according to the measure of his plan the Lord Jesus Christ himself will do the treading of the wine, plant, the wine press, the wrath of the Lamb, which some men foolishly thought to be upon him as early as the time of the seal judgments. They ain't seen nothing yet, have they? When we get to chapter 16, it will be appalling. Chapter 15 talks about the living creatures coming from the presence of God and handing to seven angels the vials filled meaning to the brim with the wrath of the Almighty I imagine that was a very careful exchange here's your bowl here's your bowl don't spill a drop Okay. Blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles. For a, diff diff for a distance of 1,600 stadia, the stadia is about 670 feet. You do the math, it's about 184 miles. The terminology suggests a sea of blood resulting from a direct confrontation on the field of battle. The depth of the blood and the land area covered are both indicative of a massive slaughter of human life. Armageddon is in the north of Palestine. The Valley of Jehoshaphat is in the south. Basra is named by Isaiah as the place where the Lord treads the winepress. And the distance between the furthest points of this front is 1,600 furlongs. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? couldn't possibly be to the depth of a bridle of a horse for 184 miles. Hello, have you met the God of the Bible? <laughs> Who sends an angel and slaughters 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one evening? It doesn't say, but I don't imagine you broke a sweat. 185,000 men in one Indicative of the death angel swooping through the entire known kingdom of Egypt and killing the firstborn man and beast in one evening. This is an unnamed angel. This is not Michael the archangel. This is not Lucifer the anointed cherub. This is just some dude. Amazing. Christ said I could have called a legion of these guys down to get me off this cross. But then we all would still be lost in our sins. Yes. According to Ezekiel 39, verses 8 through 16, seven months will be required to bury the dead. And the armaments of war will be burned for a further seven years. Wow. So much for a spiritual rendering of unimaginable carnage. When we get there, chapter 19, we'll probably close with this. Verses 11 through 21. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. This is the second white horse we've seen in the Revelation. The first one was ridden by whom? Well, you decide. Because this text describes the rider of this white horse.
There was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. <clears throat> Excuse me. And on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Are we clear about who's on this white horse? The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. I think that's us, folks. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the air. Come. <coughs> Gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Yes. <laughs> the rest of them, well, it's bad guy. You're paying attention here. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the white horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Well, this is gross. This is disgusting. And it would appear from me, based on the text, that the armies of heaven that come back with the Lord God Almighty come back as witnesses and nothing more. Because the text goes on to say, the rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. We are not here dispensing judgment. The Lamb is. <clears throat> King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's, that's chapter 19 when we get there. Hopefully this year. <laughs> Unregenerate humanity faces a frightening future, as this incredible scene indicates. Those who refuse to repent, even after repeated warnings, will learn firsthand the sobering truth that it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Where do we find that verse? What Old Testament book do we find that verse in? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews. Chapter 10. Huh. It's not in the Old Testament, is it? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 31. They would do well to heed the psalmist's admonition. Psalm chapter 2, verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you'll be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen. Chapter 
14.